Hi, I'm Nate the House Whisperer, and today we're going to talk about the coming mold explosion. Uh, some people are going to give me a hard time for this being hyperbole. Uh, from what I've been seeing this year, and in talking to a bunch of industry colleagues, this is not hyperbole. Uh, this is really starting to happen. And so we're going to dig into what's going on and why, and what you can do about it. Okay. Uh, for some of you are going to be here and you won't have any idea who I am. Not that that really matters, but it's important to have some idea of my background so you don't think that I'm crazy as I talk about these things. So uh, uh, I've written a lot of things. The Home Comfort Book is my book. Um, it's, it assumes that you are intelligent, but no, uh, don't know anything about building science, and it will bring you up to speed. It was something that I thought was missing, so I wrote it. Um, I also have a column in Healthy Indoors Magazine. I've written a lot in the past for Journal of Light Construction, uh, Green Tech Media, Clean Technica. Uh, I've spoken at the Department of Energy, or for the Department of Energy, uh, at the Healthy Building Summit, and uh, for the Home Performance Coalition. So, uh, and there's more beyond that. Not that it matters, just so you have some idea of my background. Now, more importantly, is the work that we do. So our practice is called Energy Smart Home Performance. We're based here in Cleveland, Ohio, and we do what are called comprehensive retrofits as opposed to a deep energy retrofit, uh, which involves a lot of insulation and HVAC. Uh, so there's a lot of little details that we have to plan for and uh, execute well. Uh, we have some of the deepest case studies that you will see anywhere on projects like this at energysmartohio.com, so check those out. Uh, we have a strong healthy home focus. Uh, we monitor all of our projects, and it's very important to us that we provide our clients with a healthy home, which is a lot of where this grew out of. Uh, and then most importantly, we track what happens. We track results of these projects post project. So it isn't just the project's done and we walk away. We want to know what happened over time. And that is where a lot of this learning has come from. All right. So uh, a lot of what is going on to cause this mold explosion uh, is multiple tipping points all happening at the same time. Uh, so I love this little gif uh, of a, a bus somewhere in the third world, darn near flipping over. This is what most houses today look like if uh, you live on the East Coast or any place where the grass is green without watering. So basically it's east of the Mississippi is where most of that is. Uh, you may also see this if you live in the Pacific Northwest. Now what I think is going on here, because I've put a lot of thought into this as have my partner and I, um, and it's an issue of stacked risks versus stacked benefits. So let's talk about what stacked benefits are for a second. Uh, so I perpetually need to lose weight. If you watch these videos, you'll watch multiple chins uh, appear and disappear. Um, but losing weight has multiple benefits. So say I just want to sleep better. I can't really just have that one thing. Um, if I lose weight, I will feel better. I'll have more energy. I'll sleep better. Um, uh, I, I'll be more pleasant to be around. You know, there's all of these benefits that come from it that are stacked. So you can't just have one or the other. They all come uh, part and parcel uh, as a bunch of stacked benefits. Now, what we think is going on when it comes to uh, these mold issues are stacked risks. So there's all of these little things that come together, and any one of them is enough to push things over the edge. There's multiple tipping points. So here are the ones that uh, we, we think are most important, not that there aren't more. Uh, so dew points across the country are up, with the exception of a few places in California. Um, heavy downpours are up. HVAC dehumidification is down, which means newer uh, air conditioner models don't dehumidify as well as old air conditioner models. Engineered building materials are more sensitive to moisture, so uh, they can have mold issues more easily than older building materials. And increased shading. Every year the trees grow. So that's the short, short version. Let's dig into the details. 
All right. To get mold to form, you really need four things. So you have to have mold spores, which pretty much anywhere you are, there are mold spores someplace. Uh, and if you think your environment's perfectly clean, uh, no, our bodies are actually more bacteria and mold and whatnot than they are human cells. Um, uh, and if you like cheese, that's mold spores that you like there. So uh, spores are always present everywhere. Uh, in different levels. Um, aside from that, you need the right temperature, you need the right moisture levels, and you need a food source. Um, so if you end up with those four things, you are going to have mold. The problem with those things are we can't control temperature because we have to work with whatever Mother Nature gives us. Um, we can't control food source uh, because almost everything around us is a food source. If there's paper in it, if there's dirt, um, that's a food source. So the only one that we can actually control is moisture. Um, and so I want to dig more into that. Um, and do remember, any one of these risks, if you push it far enough, is enough to tip a house and we have all of them playing. So there's those risks again. And this one just kind of cracked me up. Who's going to tip? I never know which house is going to tip, but man, have I seen a lot of issues this year? Uh, well, I guess now 2018, we're now just into 2019 and my friends in the business uh, have consistently said, boy, have you ever seen so many mold calls this year? And I haven't. Okay, let's talk about some moisture fundamentals. So we need to do a little bit of understanding and science before we can dig into what's going on. So this is a chart from the Home Comfort book, my book. And note that uh, there's dew point and relative humidity on here. So they are strongly related to each other, but they are not the same. Um, dew point is my preferred method, uh, or rather metric. Uh, because you don't need to know a second data point. So relative humidity, you have to know the relative humidity and you have to know the temperature that that is uh, in. So uh, with dew point, all you need to know is one number, which is the dew point. Uh, dew point, it, it's something that you understand, but you may not understand that you understand. So if you have a cold glass of lemonade uh, or a can of beer or any kind of beverage that's cold, if there's moisture that is forming on the outside of that glass or that can, that means that the, uh, the surface of that can and the liquid inside is colder than the dew point. So the dew point is the point at which uh, air is completely full of moisture. It can't hold a single drop more. Um, and so if air at dew point touches a surface below dew point, you will get condensation. You'll get moisture hanging onto it. Um, and dew point is a great thing for comparing because you can compare indoor and outdoor dew point and get an idea of what's going on. Um, and in general, what you want is dew points between 30% and 60%, or I'm sorry, that's, a, that's relative humidity, but dew points in the 35 degree to 55 degree range. These have, uh, it's kind of a, a sweet spot for them. Uh, now the 30 to 60%, that depends on what temperature it is. This chart here, like I said, is run at 70 degrees. Uh, so if you run a higher temperature, um, you can, uh, well, you're going to pull the relative humidity down. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, the danger zone in this chart is when you get above 55 degree uh, dew point or 60% relative. And unfortunately, they're actually both important. Dew point is the main thing that I look at, uh, but the, the relative matters too, which we'll also touch uh, on. And another thing to note is if it's it, you are not okay at 55 degrees and then it's call... Uh, the fire department at 55.1. This is not a bright line. It's just a line that you want to be careful with and not cross too often. Now, these numbers, so you know, uh, are primarily based off the work of Lou Harriman here. So the wonderful thing about my field is it's relatively small, so you can get to know everyone. Um, so uh, I've heard Lou speak a couple times, and the bright line comment I just made is pulled directly from some comments that he made. Uh, but he is the fundamental author of the moisture control 
uh, guide for the EPA. And so that's, that's pretty deep. That's not necessarily a homeowner level uh, resource, but it is free. So you can go download that. He also wrote Measured Home Performance, which is the book on the other side, uh, which talks a lot about the kind of work that we do. Um, so both of those are really good things to take a look at. But so you know, in everything I'm talking about here, I am standing on the shoulders of giants. This is not my work. Um, this is just us building on what other people have done and then using new monitoring tools to understand what's going on. Now, speaking of... Uh, giants of the industry. This is Joe Stebrick. Uh, looks like Lestebrick. Uh, it's not. He he pronounces it Stebrick. And uh, anything by him, please go read. The only caveat that I give is Joe is actually out there in the field watching things and seeing what happens and figuring out how to solve problems. So the science changes on this. So whenever you find an article by him, double check that there isn't a newer article on the uh, same subject because things may have moved. He will admit that he's wrong and then tell you why, uh, which is wonderful about him. Uh, so it's buildingscience.com. You can go read more than you want to. Uh, by Joe. He's hilarious, by the way. He's a very good writer. Now, this article uh, is from September of 2017, and it's called The Magic and Mystery of the Water Molecule. Uh, this really kind of opened my eyes. Um, I suspected that relative humidity was important, but I just didn't understand why. Uh, so this was very helpful. Um, so the conference that I developed this for, uh, this presentation for, was the Healthy Building Summit, which is all about research to practice. Now, uh, what my company, our company does, is practice to research. So we go out and we try stuff and we measure, and then we can talk to the researchers because it's a small enough world, everybody knows each other. Um, and that's a lot of what Joe does too. And this is really kind of a cool thing. It's the four phases of water. I never thought about a fourth one. So the three we know about, um, uh, solid, liquid, and gas, you know, ice, water, and vapor. But what I didn't think about was adsorbed water. So A, D is in David instead of B is in boy, adsorbed. Um, and that is moisture that is stuck in surface layers. Now, I still struggle with keeping this in my head, so if you do, don't feel alone. Um, so absorbed with a B is fluid dissolved by a liquid or solid. So that's like when you pour salt into water and it uh, becomes salt water. Uh, that salt has been uh, absorbed. Um, adsorbed with a D, as in David, is when fluid adheres to the surface of a liquid or solid. So that's right on the top. Um, a, way, a good way to think of this is like a damp towel. Um, a, a towel can be not dry but not wet because it has adsorbed some water into its surface and it hasn't given it off yet. So uh, what water does when it is adsorbed is it sticks to surfaces in one molecule thick layers. Um, and from what Joe talks about, it uh, taps out at about five layers, uh, uh, five molecules stuck on top of each other. And it is really heavily related to um, relative humidity. So and the other thing is it flows, which if you ever take a look at, so adsorbed moisture flows. Um, so if you look at a surface that has gotten moldy, you'll see where it starts uh, looking a little bit damp, a little bit damper, and then all of a sudden mold starts to grow. Uh, so it will flow along a surface, which is pretty cool. Um, now this is another chart, and this is going to be tough to read, uh, but this is uh, how much moisture contents different materials have at different levels of relative humidity. Um, and kind of the, the key finding from this is you want to stay uh, preferably under 50, maybe even under 40% relative. Uh, different materials absorb different amounts of moisture. Uh, 
So uh, the drier you can keep them, the better, and the less adsorbed moisture you're going to have in them. Now, a different way to look at this, this to me is simpler. I like to think in spectrums in general, as you saw from the, the dew point chart earlier. Uh, this is from ASHRAE, uh, the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers, uh, if memory serves. Um, and so this is looking for the optimum zone. So take a look at the blue zone here. That's between 40 and 60% relative humidity. Uh, you can see that there's a whole bunch of risks that they're looking at, bacteria, funguses, um, uh, viruses, dust mites, respiratory infections, so lots of different things. Uh, and what you want to do is uh, keep things preferably in like the 40 to 60% range. So that's the hope. This is a different one. This is from Santa Fe Dehumidifiers. They make uh, dehumidifiers for crawl spaces and the like. Um, and they recommend going lower. And so do we, like 30 to 50% is really more of the sweet spot in my mind. Uh, but uh, you'll see different things about uh, this chart. This is a good chart to look for. Now, if you wanna figure all this stuff out, there's a really nice online calculator. This is a uh, dew point calculator, uh, and it's dpcalc.com, and it's put out by the Image Permeance Institute. So uh, it's a consortium that works together to help art museums keep their art in as good of condition for as long uh, of a period as possible. Uh, but they have this really nice little calculator that will tell you a bunch of risks. So you can solve for whatever you want. You can see in this case, I set it to 75 degrees, and then I wanted to find a 70 degree dew point. So this condition happened a lot here in Cleveland this past year. I'd say there was about two months worth of days that were like this. This is a really, really tough condition because it's not very warm outside, so you don't need much air conditioning, but there's a ton of moisture in the air, which leads to all kinds of bad things. So this is a common thing. So if you leave the windows open in your house in this period, this is what you're gonna get. So take a look at the risk over here. Uh, now, like I said, this is for art. So you start seeing natural aging, which is not something we normally care about. But take a look at the mold risk here. Days to mold, nine days. That's not very long. Uh, you can play with these and uh, learn and see what, what the risks are. So dpcalc.com, I highly recommend you go take a look at it. Now, same chart, kept at 75 degrees, pulled the relative humidity down to 45%. Um, this may be slightly on the low side, but not massively on the low side. Uh, we see client homes getting into this range pretty consistently. Um, that works out to a 53 degree dew point. So remember, relative and dew point. Um, the dew point is the one that we're really looking for. But take a look at the mold risk here. Now there's no mold risk at all. Um, so uh, it's the kind of thing that you want to pay attention to. So play with that, and you'll quickly begin to understand what the relationships are. Okay, so I mentioned I've had a lot of friends talk about problems in the field they've seen this year. So I want to talk about some of them. So uh, this is from several years ago. This is from Stefan Peter Contest of uh, E3 Innovate in Nashville, Tennessee. This is the floor of a dirt crawl space here. Um, and this is a dead possum that was sitting on the floor of the crawl space. This is a return duct that had fallen off. So this return duct was picking up dead possum and this being an unsealed crawl space, all the dampness and mold and yuck down here was getting sucked right into the house. This is no good. Um, and if you live in a house that has a crawl space, the odds are something like this is going on. Uh, you can do what's called the lemon pledge test if you want to understand if the crawl space is connected to the house. Have one person crawl into the basement, spray some lemon, pre uh, lemon pledge, and then have somebody upstairs uh, sniff to see if they can smell it and the odds are really good you're going to. Um, just because you live above a crawl space don't think that that crawl space isn't part of your house. It is um, with almost 100% certainty. 
So that's one example. Uh, this is an example from my friend Blake Reed. Um, he used to live in Ithaca, New York, and he moved to Hawaii uh, a year and a half ago or so. And uh, he's <laughs> relearning a bunch of stuff about moisture because Hawaii is a very damp climate depending where you are. He lives on the wet side of the Big Island, and they have lots of issues there with uh, dampness and mold. Um, so on the left here, this is a piece of furniture in a client house that is just flat out growing mold on the outside of it. You don't see that on hard wood very often, so that means really, really high moisture uh, levels for a long time. And that makes sense because this is the little data logger that he put in there to track how uh, wet and what temperature is going on all the time. So 76 degrees at 93% relative humidity, that is really, really wet. Um, and you can also see on this picture on the right, uh, this is a, a wine cooler or a beer cooler, uh, and it's just sweating on the outside, even though the glass on this usually isn't that cold. So pretty crazy. Um, and if you happen to live in Hawaii, be sure you go check out Blake's website, or well, you check them out if you don't live there, but uh, you might call Blake if you do live out there to help you solve problems. Now, that same house there, they put a big whole house dehumidifier into it, and uh, this house is really unusual. This is something you really only see in Hawaii. Hawaii has extremely expensive electricity rates. They pay about 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, here in Ohio, we pay 13 cents, and that's kind of national average. That's right in the middle. Uh, so it's so expensive to get electricity there that a lot of people go off grid. So they have a solar system with battery panels, and that's what happened here. So uh, uh, they turned on the dehumidifier up here, and you can see that the levels come down over time. And it took a while, because um, what is this? Uh, this is 12 hours of time here, and this is another 12 hours. So this house was so damp that a great big dehumidifier took a full day to dry this place out. Um, and then it stayed not, not as low as I'd like to see, but at least kind of sort of low. The issue was because they have solar plus batteries, they ran out of juice um, and the whole thing had to shut down. And then you can see how quickly the relative humidity came back up. And then it turned back on and watch the second time how quickly that it was able to dry the house out because most of the work had been done over here. Uh, so that it was much easier to dry it out the second time. Um, but they probably opened the windows here as well, which I'll talk about uh, at the tail end of uh, this video. So that was Blake Reed. Here's uh, Danny Gao, who does HVAC design and uh, building forensics uh, down in North Carolina. And he said that he's been seeing a bunch of stuff this year. And he posted on Facebook a couple of months ago, this photo. Take a look at all the garbage going on on the ceiling. So that's a bunch of mold growing on the ceiling and the paint is peeling over here off of uh, the fireplace. Uh, this was kind of crazy. And um, what he noticed was the humidity levels in this house were running way, way too high. So they had the thermostat turned down pretty low in this house at 71. But take a look at that. It's 70% relative humidity. Um, and uh, so going back to this photo, air conditioning air that comes out, comes out at 50 to 55 degrees on average. Uh, that's what the temperature it is when it comes out of the duct. So this surface here was pretty cold because it has that cold air blowing across it. Um, but the house is still pretty damp. There's a lot of moisture in the air. So there's a lot of moisture sticking to that surface like Steve was talking about. And uh, so you get all kinds of bad things happening. So that's one example. Uh, second example there. Third example here, this is my friend Neil Comparetto. Neil is one of the best HVAC techs in the country. Um, it's, he continually amazes me with the stuff that he just grasps quickly. Um, and by the way, he's just gone out on his own uh, as well with uh, Comparetto Comfort. So uh, this here is a picture that he took uh, in a client home. This is a knee wall here. So um, maybe this will be more helpful. This is from an article I wrote years ago. 
about insulating knee walls. Uh, so if you look at the side of a house that is a Cape Cod or a bungalow, this is the living space. So the walls will look shaped like this, kind of like a U. What we're looking at here is a picture of this wall from inside this little attic. This is called a knee wall attic. Uh, any attic that has, or sorry, any wall that has an attic on the other side of it is called a knee wall. So this is inside this knee wall after he peeled the insulation out of here. Uh, this reading won't mean a whole lot to you, but that is way high for what drywall should be. Way, way high. Um, so, uh, and you can see mold growing right on the surface here. That's no good. Um, and a, a lot of what was causing this was this client had just had not one but two brand new air conditioners put in that were too large. So uh, to be able to pull the humidity down, they were turning the temperature way down. So this is the only picture he had. It was 69 degrees. He said their other one was set at like 64 or 65 degrees. This is in North Carolina, or I'm sorry, excuse me, this is uh, Virginia. And in Virginia, their dew points are routinely 70 degrees. So this set point is already below dew point. And then, like I mentioned earlier, you have air coming out of the vents that is 50 or 55 degrees. It's just no good. Like you are asking for trouble there. Um, you need to run things warmer and drier to avoid this risk. So that was a, a, a tough project to figure out. And that was causing health issues for the wife of the house too, which happens when you live in a damp building too much, and particularly if you have the right gene, which makes you more sensitive to mold and mycotoxins, which are uh, something that the mold spits out. Now, this picture is from a builder friend of mine in North Carolina. Um, he has been struggling with uh, just having mold growing on his new builds as he's putting them up. So you can see this house here, it's still in framing stage, so you can't put HVAC into this yet. It's just open to the outdoors. Um, but take a look up here, like that's all mold that's starting to grow. Um, and then uh, th this is mold that's starting to grow. This picture was taken in mid-October, uh, so he's been really struggling with it this year. Um, so you're you're going to get a new house and there's going to be some garbage going on. So basically your house will be moisture damaged as you buy it if you live in the south. And as I'll talk about later, moisture damaged buildings need to be treated like cancer patients. They are cancer survivors. You can never let off. You always have to keep that in mind. You always have to keep them dry. Uh, so unfortunately, most of the houses being built on the east coast right now have these issues and should really be treated like they're moisture damaged. Now another fellow who uh, I've been talking to about moisture is John Tooley. So he's another one of the quote unquote old guys. Joe Stebrick talks about learning things from the old guys. Uh, and he learned back when he was in his 30s and 20s and now he's becoming one of the old guys. Uh, so is John Tooley. Uh, John has developed a lot of the better building practices. Um, uh, and he worked at Advanced Energy. He retired a few years ago. Um, uh, but I asked him when I saw him back in October, so what are you seeing at your house? Because he lives in South Carolina. Um, and he said, dew points are usually in the upper 60s in the summer at my home. This summer, they were consistently in the 70s and even into the 80s. So he's getting these outrageous amounts of moisture uh, in the outdoors. Uh, and like this isn't a crazy climate. South Carolina is not a crazy climate. So uh, that's another example of very high moisture levels. This popped up. If this is your photo, please speak up because I don't remember whose photo this was. I pulled it off of a Facebook group. Uh, I have seen this before. Uh, this is a picture of a garage ceiling, and this is mold bloom forming. And this is an awful lot of mold because this has gone through the drywall uh, and begun to grow. So there's a lot going on here. What's going on is right above here, there is a duct. And that duct is running cold, but because the garage is outside of the area that you heat and cool, it's exposed to high levels of humidity. It condenses on it, and then it drips. And then because you have mold food in the drywall, uh, the paper on both sides of the drywall is mold food, um, you get this really distinct line. So I have seen this before, 
in basements and in garages, but I've never seen a line quite that distinct. Uh, and so this is something that you're probably going to see. Another mold issue, now this is mainly in colder climates uh, that have bath fans that dump into the attic. Uh, if you think about what's going on, if it's wintertime, it's cold in your attic, all the surfaces are cold. So if you pump humid air from taking a shower into the garage, it's going to stick to the building materials and uh, condense and if the temperature fluctuates in the right way mold can take hold there. So I routinely see attic mold problems caused by bath fans. This should be vented outdoors. Um, so if you have bathroom fans make sure they get vented either through the roof or through the wall. Don't go through the soffit. Um, sixth chapter of my book is about how to do bath fans right and you can go read more about why you don't want to do soffits there. That's a free download. This is one of my clients. Uh, this is actually a monastery uh, just down the road from my house and uh, the monks wear very heavy clothing. They wear robes all year. Uh, so they like cooler temperatures so that they don't sweat too much as they work. The problem is um, what you can see here, this is moisture forming on double pane windows. So these are halfway decent windows uh, because this area is being kept too cold. Now if you can see moisture here, the odds are almost 100% that there's moisture elsewhere that you can't see. So you could be rotting things out or you could be causing mold elsewhere. So use your windows as the canary in the coal mine. If you ever see condensation on them, something should be adjusted. Now in this same monastery, uh, uh, this is in the church side, um, you can see up here where uh, there's a lot of dirt sticking to the walls and then also up here. Then this is an infrared camera. This is taken on a cold day and you can see this little bit here corresponds to this. So what's going on is because they use a bunch of incense and burn a bunch of oil in this space, there's a lot of particulate and dust in the air and then it sticks to the cold surfaces uh, because they're a little bit damp in the winter. So you can see precisely where things are insulated or not insulated. Like if you notice on the ceiling, you can tell the ceiling is insulated because the coldest spot is uh, where the joists are, which is pretty interesting. So this is the first time I got to see this. That was fun to figure out. Um, so those are a couple of wintertime issues uh, that I'm showing as well that can lead to problems. Now, this is a client that uh, we helped out in, in uh, fall of 2018. We haven't executed this project yet, but what he complained of, one of the complaints, was that he gets a bunch of condensation on ductwork, and look how much is going on here. This day was just the kind of day that I was talking about earlier. It was about 70 degrees out, and it was a 70 degree dew point. So the air conditioner just can't do that, uh, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Air conditioners take out heat and humidity, but they take out way more heat than they do humidity. And uh, this house had an oversized air conditioner, so it could not keep the house dry, even though it was one of the nicest air conditioners on the market residentially. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens here. We'll talk about what the solution to this looks like later. Um, but uh, man, I, I haven't seen ducks sweat that bad. If you have ducks in your basement, by the way, and they're galvanized, which most of them are, uh, if you look and you see the galvanized looks dull, that is a really good sign that those have been damp for a lot of their lives uh, because it's basically starting to oxidize the uh, the galvanized coating off of them. So again, if you see dull ducts rather than shiny galvanized, that's a sign of moisture. Now the other thing that we see more and more recently is uh, rust on uh, vent outlets. So this is another sign that things are getting too cold and too moist. So see how there's rust around this vent? This vents in a ceiling here, which in much of the country is really common. Uh, here in Cleveland, it's only a handful of houses that have uh, uh, ducts in the ceiling, but here was one of them. Now, you may also see this in ducts in the floor. This is a big house right up on Lake Erie uh, that we worked on a couple of years ago, and this client at least likes to keep it really, really cold. 
like mid sixties cold. Um, he asked me for a meat locker. Uh, and one of the consequences of doing that is you can see that this floor grate is getting quite damp and quite rusty. This is not a good sign. This is a sign that there's other bad things going on someplace else. And then here's another picture uh, of kind of the opposite thing. So when the air conditioner is running and the metal uh, can cool off quickly, you can get condensation right on the metal. So this is what it looks like dry. This is what it looks like while the air conditioner is running. Um, and you don't want to see this. If you see this, there's issues in your house. You need to keep it drier. Now, this house has hardwood flooring, and all kinds of problems can be caused by letting hardwood floors get too damp. So be very, very careful with this, please. So to sum all of the practice to research stuff up, Houston, we have a problem, uh, which is ironic because Houston got hit by a hurricane this year, and they have lots and lots of wet and damp and moisture build, moisture damaged buildings now. Um, so that kind of sucks. Okay, so <laughs> all of that was really by way of introduction. Um, so let's talk about the tipping points at this point. So let's talk about the stack risk. So we're going to talk about increased dew points, increased heavy downpours, uh, how HVAC dehumidification is down over what it used to be. We're going to talk about engineered building materials, and we're going to talk about increased shading. So dew points, there's a really, really important thing to understand about them. Outdoor dew points are controlled primarily by nighttime temperatures. So if at night, well, say during the day it's 90 degrees, but at night it gets down to 60, the dew point cannot be above outside temperature. So in the morning when you wake up uh, and there's a bunch of dew on the grass, that means that the air got below dew point and all of that moisture condensed out onto the grass. Uh, so if it gets to be 60 degrees at night, the dew point can't be above 60. So it, if the dew point in the middle of the day is 70, that 10 degrees worth of dew point, however much moisture content that is, has to come out and stick to something else. So it'll stick to the trees, it'll stick to the grass, it'll stick to the side of your house, uh, it'll stick to any surface that is uh, below dew point. Um, now, this is important because I remember reading this. So this is an article back in 2009, so uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, where a weather caster had noted that Cleveland area uh, nighttime temperatures were up. So the daytime temperatures were the same in the summertime here, but our nighttime temps were up. And like I said, dew point and nighttime temperatures, th those two are really, really strongly related. Um, and so th that was part of what made me start thinking about this 10 years ago. Then there's a website called Climate Central. And uh, I encourage everybody to go look this up. You can look up uh, steamier summers and Climate Central. So uh, knowing uh, that the summer dew points are up, or at least it feels like they are, because this, this past summer here in Cleveland, it wasn't that hot for the summer, but it was really muggy all summer. Uh, and we're not used to that here, so I didn't want to work outside. Uh, and we ran the air conditioner a lot more than we usually do. Um, uh, so uh, I went looking for data on that, and I found this chart from Climate Central, and they have this for 100 different cities across the U.S. So this is Cleveland dew points going back to 1980. So I was born in 78. Uh, so this goes back basically to when I was born. And then it plots summer dew points. Um, uh, over that period and you can see that there is a rising trend so it's not gigantic although as far as overall climate goes it's it's a pretty big deal uh, it's about three degrees we went from a little over 59 to about 62 degrees and like I said we saw 70 degree dew points a lot this summer more than I can ever remember um, now because I've got so many friends in North Carolina I took a look at Raleigh as well, and you can see that Raleigh is up. So I think of John Tooley here. Uh, I think of Sean Jessup, the builder. Um, uh, I think of, uh, well, Neil Camperetto lives in Virginia. Uh, Stephen Rarden, who lives in the Raleigh area. So there's a lot of people that live in this area, and you can see that it's pulling up, and they've mentioned how dew points are higher. And like I said, mold calls are more frequent. 
This is a totally different climate. This is Miami. Uh, so you note where here we're starting at 64 degrees. Miami, we're starting about 75. Miami's sticky. You really need to pay attention to keeping things dry in Miami, which is part of why you don't see a lot of stick-built houses uh, there. Most of them are now built out of block uh, to that and hurricane reasons, but you, you have fewer issues when you're, you're looking at block. Uh, but you can see that their average dew point is up over time. I was also curious, like, so what about a northern climate? So what's the, the furthest north city that I could find, and Fargo, uh, uh, North Dakota, was the one that I found. So you can see their dew point is up pretty substantially as well uh, over the past 40 years or so. The one that surprised me the most was I looked at Vegas, and see, look, Vegas is up 7 degrees from 43 to about 50. Um, the good news for Vegas is it's still dry enough that they're kind of they, they aren't in trouble yet. But I was shocked that the steepest gradient of all the houses or all the houses, all of the climates that I looked at uh, was in Vegas. Now, the one that throws it all off, though, uh, I mentioned earlier is California. So this is San Diego and you can see that their levels are dropping slightly. But this was the only exception that I found when I was hunting. Um, and again, you can go take a look at this, uh, look up Climate Central and steamier summers and see what's going on in your climate. This is just weather data. So um, to tie those things back together, dew points only drop down to nighttime lows. Higher lows mean a higher daytime dew point. So higher lows can lead to more mold. Uh, so this is one of the tipping point factors. So again, Houston, we have a problem. Next thing is heavy downpours. So uh, heavy downpours are up a lot uh, over the uh, well over the last sixty years, seventy years. This goes back to nineteen fifty. Um, and so take a look at the scale. If it's white, basically there's no increase in heavy. Uh, precipitation. So this is the heaviest 1% of precipitation. So think like one inch rain events and more enough to where you actually get some flooding. Uh, you know, it may just be the puddle in your yard that gets wet, uh, but um, there's definitely an increase. So it basically, if you get into anything that's blue, you're talking about 20% and up. Uh, so if memory serves, Ohio was 25, 27% uh, our downpours are up since 1950. You can see that a few states are just crazy and almost the whole country is up on downpours. So some of this is going to be thanks to uh, the hurricanes that we're getting. So that's a piece of the puzzle. So these are the kind of things that you think about. But more than likely, the downpours are up because of just storms. Um, most of the country doesn't get hurricanes. We get storms. And uh, this is something to pay attention to. It's also something we need to be very cautious with. Uh, because what happens is we get very damp and dank uh, crawl spaces and basements. Uh, it's hard on the foundations. So this is a client home that is now fixed. Uh, we encapsulated this crawl space. So we got spray foam on the walls and a very thick vapor barrier on the floor. Uh, but when he bought this house a couple years ago, he said, oh good, look, it's dry. He bought it in the summertime. Crawl space was dry. He's like, oh, thank goodness. Um, well, it's not dry anymore. And he has been getting sick because the house is just too stinking damp. Um, so th that's a bummer. He feels like garbage a lot. Uh, his respiratory system is suffering. Uh, and part of what was going on is there's heavy downpours and there's a tree where you, you can't see it obviously, but on the other side of this corner, um, that was uh, keeping water from, uh, it was, well, because it was mounded up, it was actually pushing water back towards the house. So one of our recommendations was to get rid of that tree and get the root system out. But in general, this house needed a little bit more love on the drainage uh, side of things, and it was heavily around these two walls. Uh, so to deal with all the drainage, we recommend is six inch uh, gutters and the six inch downpour spouts. So uh, my wife and I, what just we have to design for now, spent a little bit of time in Costa Rica, and they have these huge gutters just running like they're just in the road. 
um, alongside the road. They have these massive gutters and they're made to handle the heavy downpours that they get in rainy season. We need to start thinking that way so that we can keep moisture away from our foundations so that the moisture doesn't get into the house and then cause other problems. So in the same crawl space, this is a, a piece of MDF that was just sitting on the floor and you can see how it was molding up. It was really gross. So again, heavy downpours are up. We have an issue. The next piece of the puzzle is HVAC dehumidification. So HVAC is heating, ventilation, and cooling. This is your furnace and air conditioner, your heat pump, whatever it is that heats and cools your house. Um, and as I joke here, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Um, this is a, a little graphic from a wonderful video series. Uh, it's called Passive House for Everyone by Adam Cohen. Um, if you want to dig into what Passive House is or just gain more understanding of uh, building science, this is another really good resource to go to. But he talks about uh, the two kinds of heat. So sensible heat is heat heat, like you think. It's temperature uh, heat versus latent heat, which is moisture in the air. Um, and how this works is if you have an air conditioner, it usually does somewhere between 70 and 80% sensible work, which means taking heat. That's the air conditioning part that you think of, taking heat out of the air. Um, and then it does 20 or 30% latent heat, uh, which is the dehumidification. Um, the trouble is, like we mentioned earlier, if you have 75 degree temperatures and a 70 degree dew point, you kind of need to flip these. You only need 20 or 30% sensible. Um, and then the rest you want to be dehumidification, but there is no air conditioner that will do that. Um, and so switching from looking at the 70 to 80 and 20 to 30 to looking at it as a bar chart, this is uh, a little chart that I saw and it's looking at office air conditioning needs, uh, but this, this illustrates both old and new HVAC as well as um, uh, like what we what we need moving forward. So typical air conditioners do something like this or older air conditioners do a lot of latent work. Um, so they do like a third latent um, and then two thirds heat or sensible. So it's hu humidity and heat. Um, newer air conditioners do very little dehumidification in general and a lot of uh, heat cooling. So uh, this is called the sensible heat ratio and one of the curses is when you see higher efficiency air conditioners what they're usually doing to get to the higher efficiency is they're decreasing how much dehumidification is done by increasing the temperature of the coil inside which is getting technical I realize that uh, but uh, when you see more efficient air conditioning that doesn't necessarily mean that it's truly more efficient. It means that it's doing more cooling and less dehumidification in most cases. Um, another, this is also good because this is talking about uh, like a general office in a building is going to need um, you know, a, a heavy bit of latent and some sensible. Where the computer room where you have a bunch of computers running and creating a ton of heat, you need to um, remove the heat more so than the humidity there. And like I said, uh, older, less efficient air conditioners look like this. Newer, more efficient uh, air conditioners look like this. Now, I need to narrow down. I'm talking primarily about single stage equipment. So it's either on or it's off. So I'm not talking two stage and I'm definitely not talking uh, multiple stage or modulating equipment. If you want to read more about that, uh, HVAC 101, the second chapter of my book, it's a free download and that will help you wrap your head around that. Uh, but if you just have a single stage, which about 80% of air conditioners out there are single stage and you have a newer one, it looks more like this, which means it's not doing nearly as much dehumidification as the last one. 
The other issue that happens, so uh, Energy Vanguard, and Allison, uh, which is written by Allison Bales, this is an image that he posted a couple years ago. It cracked me up, talking about oversized air conditioners. So air conditioners only start to dehumidify after they've been running something like 10 or 15 minutes. Some of them might be five, but they need to be running for a while before uh, they start doing a lot of dehumidification. If you upsize the air conditioner in your house, you're making things worse because now it may not even run for that 10 or 15 minutes before it starts doing lots of dehumidification. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, so don't upsize, if anything, you want to downsize, which we'll talk about. Um, and I mentioned Lou Harriman earlier. Uh, this is from his book, Measured Home Performance. It's a little bit tricky to read, but it's a, a husband talking to his wife. The husband's wearing this gigantic suit that's obviously way too big for him. Um, and he says, uh, and they sold me the next size larger for only 10% more. Um, you don't need the next size larger in most cases. So what the decreased dehumidification does, that was a big chunk of what was going on here. Uh, we all, as humans, are trying to seek comfort. So if, if our sweat, particularly as men, so men have metabolisms that are on average 30% faster than women. Um, so we give off a lot of heat by sweat, so it needs to evaporate. And if it's going to evaporate, relative humidity needs to be low or else it can't evaporate easily. So we go turn down the air conditioner so that we pull the humidity down to where we're starting to get comfortable. But then we get mold forming and then also our ladies typically get unhappy because now they're cold. Um, so modern uh, HVAC can actually be problematic for this. So again, um, we don't have as much dehumidification going on, but as we talked about uh, with both increased dew points and increased downpours, we have more moisture that needs to be removed. Now, back to what it takes to grow mold. You need spores, the right temperature, moisture, and a food source, um, and then you get mold. The new engineered building materials which, well, they're not that new. They go back to, say, 1950. Um, even plywood is technically an engineered building material. Um, all of those tend to have, they're a much better food source for mold than old growth wood. So uh, this always chucks me up, uh, chucks me up, um, cracks me up. Joe Stebrick, uh talks about how OSB, oriented strand board, is the spam of wood. And it's totally true when you think about it. I mean, spam is chunks of ham chopped up and put into a, a box. And OSB is chunks of wood glued together and put together into sheets. Um, so he talks about it being the spam of wood, but mold also views it as the spam of wood. So here's some other things that happen with engineered building materials. They have more synthetic ingredients. So OSB has a lot of glue in it, um, and that glue is oftentimes attractive. They tend to be more susceptible to moisture problems because they will expand and contract more as you get them wet and dry. Um, older building materials, if you get them to grow mold, you are really trying. So uh, this uh, is a couple of photos from a house that I visited uh, four or five years ago now. I wrote an article in Journal of Light Construction called The Petri Dish House. Uh, this was a client who, uh, she was from Sri Lanka and she was trying to recreate that climate inside her Cleveland home. You can't do that. Um, well, you can, as she showed, but you shouldn't do that because all kinds of bad things happen. Uh, so they were cleaning the whole house with bleach weekly, uh, just trying to keep the mold knocked down. And this was in their attic. So uh, this is the floor in the attic. We pulled a rug back. And because the surface was cold here, there was mold forming there. This is the roof deck. You can see mold forming here. But to do this, they were running six room dehumidifiers and the humidifier uh, on, did I say dehumidifiers? Six room humidifiers and the furnace humidifier running full blast. So they were putting a massive amount of moisture into this and all three of their boys have asthma. Um, and I really think it's because they were pushing it with this. It's, it's a bummer and they, they weren't receptive. Um, another engineered building material, I'm using this photo a lot from Neil. Um, it, 
this is just drywall. So drywall has paper on both sides of it. That's mold food. It's an engineered building material. If you talk about old school lath and plaster, there is no paper. Um, so you really have to work hard to get the old building materials to mold up. All right, so here's how engineered building materials work. Um, so when you insulate anything, you create a cold surface because the inside of the cavity is now warm and the outside is now cold. So that cold surface can create condensation if there's a lot of moisture in the air. Um, condensation is adsorbed or absorbed into the building materials. So now you've got damp or wet building materials. These engineered building materials tend to be more moisture sensitive than the old ones. Uh, and so then you can oftentimes get mold growing because there's food there for the mold to eat. So therefore, insulation creates moisture problems. An old house that was uninsulated, you just throw heat at it and it would just dry the thing out from the inside out. So we have to spend a lot of time and effort trying to keep modern homes dry or else we can have all kinds of different problems. So, touching back on that, engineered building materials can be a much better food source. I love this line from Joe. He says this consistently in a bunch of different ways. Things are going to get wet. The key is to make sure that they can get dry. So, again, we have a problem. The last thing is increased shading. So over time, trees are going to grow. They're going to cast more shade on a building, which you may not think of as a bad problem. And oftentimes it's not. Like it, it makes the cooling load less because you aren't warming up all those building materials. But warming up those building materials dries out the building materials. And that's really, really important uh, when it comes to uh, avoiding mold issues and moisture issues. So you want the sun to shine on things and dry it out. But if the trees are growing over top, it's an issue. So this is a house that I visited with uh, Stephen Rarden uh, down in the Raleigh area. And beautiful house, just a lovely house. Uh, but they've been having issues with mold growing on all kinds of stuff inside. Um, and we went to the county records. So this photo on the right is from when the house was built. And note that the trees are pretty spindly. There's not a whole lot going on. Um, this is a different angle, obviously, but this is the most recent photo in the, the county records. You can see there's this. And so this tree is getting pretty mature. These are getting filled out more. Um, and so there was a lot of extra shade on this house that it didn't used to have. Plus, it just got new HVAC. Plus, dew points are up. So the increased shading is one of the pieces of the puzzle of what caused issues in this house. But uh, to me, there's four different things that were going on. So we have the increased shading, obviously. The ducts in this house are quite leaky, so they're sucking a lot of outdoor air in, which means if it's damp, you're pulling lots of humidity in. Um, they just put in new HVAC about two years ago, and it's a higher efficiency, which again means less dehumidification in most cases. And they stepped it up a half a size on two of the three systems in this house. Plus, dew points are up. So we've got four different factors going on. So again, we have a problem. So all of these are potential tipping points. Any one of them can tip a house. But when you look at them as a stack uh, risk, so there's all of these different risks that come together um, between dew points being up, downpours being up, dehumidification being down, engineered materials being more moisture sensitive, uh, yet we're using insulation, which creates more moisture issues, and increased shading. All of these things together mean that it doesn't take a whole lot to tip a house. And again, it's been frustrating to watch. So we come to how do we deal with all of this? So we could just sit there in the rain, dejected like this guy. Or we could spin our wheels, but not go anywhere. Or we could go about it in a way that makes it unpleasant for everyone, that's jerky and not planned, um, and not thinking ahead for a bunch of problems. Or I love this one, we can deal with it with aplomb. So here's this guy water skiing. 
Or I like this guy just engineered around it. Gotta wait for it. Boom, he pops up driving that big thing. But that's that's just dealing with the problem. It's not solving it. I'd rather be smooth as silk and deal with the root causes of the issue and basically look like a genius without necessarily having to be one. So here's how we deal with it. Uh, we monitor. We strongly recommend keeping windows closed, which is a frustrating recommendation, but I'll show you why. And we have to keep it dry all the time. So remember, moisture damage buildings are like cancer survivors. The building must always be treated as moisture damaged. You can never ever let go. Um, you might also think about this as um, uh, like AA. Um, so I've been clean and sober for this long. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot to tip things back to bad things. So you can never ever let off. So one of the best ways to understand what's going on is to monitor. So I've had clients that are like, oh, I've got these little the tiny things, they're $10, and those are really useful, temperature and humidity monitors. Um, but you can't watch what's going on all the time. You can't watch what's going on when you're sleeping or when you're at work. So it's best to have a monitor to keep an eye on what's going on all the time. And you want to keep your relative humidity below 60% all the time and preferably below 50% or else you might be doing something like this guy. So back to this little chart here, 35 to 55 degrees is kind of the good range for uh, dew points and 30 to 60% relative humidity. In the winter time you'll keep it on the lower side, in the summertime you'll keep it on the higher side is usually how that works. Um, now when you monitor, you can learn things. So this is one of my clients, um, and we have three FUBOTs in this house. So FUBOT ended up being our favorite. I tested a whole bunch of different monitors, um, and I liked this one really well because the numbers were relatively trustworthy, and they've got this nice dashboard where I can log in and see what's going on in client houses and compare different monitors over time. So this is humidity, and this is a period when things should be starting to dry out, and you can see at the end here they are. But notice how things are uh, kind of wild here, and then they go up and down and up and down. Um, these clients were opening windows, um, and so every time they opened windows, but when it was humid outside, the relative humidity would shoot up. So I got a call from this client, Nate, my wife wants to open the windows all the time. Uh, what, what should I do? And I'm like, well, you probably have to let her open the windows, but you should probably show her the numbers and let her know that she could be causing some risks by doing so. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the weather finally started to cool off, and you can see that the, the humidity levels were starting to come down. Um, but when you monitor, you can see what's happening. So this is the 60% level, and you can see there were some spikes that were definitely above 60%, and then it starts to come down. Uh, Fubot is just about to come out with a new dashboard, which now includes dew point, so I'm tickled, uh, so I don't have to calculate what the dew point is. Now when it comes to choosing a monitor, so indoor air quality monitors are my favorite because they measure more than just temperature and humidity. Uh, the FUBOT I like because it also measures particulate matter or dust and VOCs um, or chemical pollutants. Um, so if you look up, this is uh, out of my column in Healthy Indoors Magazine, best indoor air quality monitors, or if you Google it, you'll get my website and review so you can go and understand uh, how I tested some of these and which ones I ended up liking best. But the cliff note version is FUBOT is by far our favorite. Um, actually, here's a photo of it. So if you watch over time, you can understand what's going on. Now, I mentioned windows closed uh, just a couple slides ago. This is really important and it is really frustrating because most of us like opening the windows when the weather is nice outside. Although probably half of that is if you feel like you wanna open the windows in your house, your air quality probably sucks and it should probably be dealt with in whatever way it needs to be dealt with. Getting a monitor is definitely the beginning of that process. 
So, but back to my friend Blake Reed's project, uh, this is a different chart of that house that he put a dehumidifier in. See how these are going up, down, up, down, up, down. Every time it goes up is when his clients open the windows and they dumped humidity back into the house. Um, it doesn't take much. If you open one window this far, you can easily double the total leakage of your house. Uh, the air leakage. So if you open five or ten windows, you have utterly lost control over your house. Uh, it's basically like drilling a bunch of one-foot holes in the bottom of a boat and wondering why it sank. Um, this is frustrating. People don't like to hear that they need to keep their windows closed. If you pay attention to this, you bring in fresh air, you keep it dry, you move the air around in the house, you can get really good indoor air quality in a house. But don't operate it like this. Um, it's not the best way to do it. Okay, uh, so in keeping it dry, ideal summer conditions, in my opinion, and I'm sure there will be arguments over this, Keep a house between 75 and 80 degree set point. If you keep the relative humidity nice and low in the 40 to 50% range, guys will be happy because our sweat will evaporate, so we'll actually stay cool, and the temperature will be high enough that our wives won't bother that much, or won't be bothered by uh, that uh, temperature or humidity. The key thing that we're trying to do here, remember, is we want to keep surfaces above dew point. And particularly when the air conditioner is running and you've got that 50 to 55 degree air coming out, you want to attempt to keep all the surfaces in the house um, to where dew point is below 50 or 55 um, so that you don't get weird things happening around your air conditioning vents. The problem with this is very few air conditioners are capable of holding 75 degrees at 45% relative humidity. Um, so ideally what we need, and I mentioned it earlier, is we need to flip these. We need almost entirely latent or humidity work and only a little bit of sensible or uh, actual cooling work. But that doesn't truly exist. So you can solve this to some extent as a partial solution by installing a smaller air conditioner that's multiple stage. So multiple stage will stage down. What you want is for the air conditioner to run 24-7 whenever uh, dehumidification is needed. That's impossible. It will not happen. But you want to get as close to it as you possibly can. Now, another partial solution, this is something we use on some client homes, uh, is a whole house dehumidifier. This is the dehumidifier here. They're very large. So this is the furnace here. Um, and that is the dehumidifier. These two pieces of equipment are almost the same size um, and almost the same weight. Um, so this is not a cheap piece of equipment, uh, but this will keep your whole house dry without cooling it. Um, so uh, it's a tool in the toolbox. But the trouble is, what if the house is so leaky, like this one here, that no matter what you try to do, you can't keep it dry? This is where you have to step back and look at this not from an HVAC perspective. So this is not your air conditioner's fault. Um, this is a chart out of the Home Comfort book. Uh, and you want to think of your house like a leaky boat. So if you have a boat that is constantly trying to sink because of water coming into it through leaks, you don't want to try and solve for the leaks by putting in a bigger bilge pump or going faster with a bigger engine. Those are not the root cause of that problem. The root cause is you've got a hole in the bottom of your boat, so you have to fix um, that leak so that you don't have the, the moist air from outside coming into your house that then you have to dry. So you want the house as tight as possible. Now, to dig into this more, these are the two chapters of my book that are really formative and that are also free. Uh, so this is Home Comfort 101 and this is HVAC 101. Uh, so at natethehousewhisperer.com, you can go and download them, and you can dig into what it looks like to tighten a house, why, what the science is behind it, and then also what the right piece of HVAC looks like. So those are really critical to understand. Um, and those are two chapters out of this book. Now, I have what I call the five priorities of home performance, which are to air seal, air seal some more, keep air sealing, insulate, and then put the right HVAC in to your house. 
So the, that is the order that every house looks like if you want to deal with this. So if the coming mold explosion has already arrived in your life, this is the path one way or another. So just to review, we touched on all these things. Dew points are up, downpours are up, dehumidification's down, new building materials don't like moisture, and we have taller trees than we used to. So I hope that was helpful to everyone to understand why mold is likely to become a bigger and bigger problem uh, in our lives, particularly if you live in a climate that has moist summer. So if you have green grass without watering it. So I'm Nate the House Whisperer. If you enjoyed this, please share it. Please like, comment, ask me questions. I'm sure this is going to create some discussion. And have yourself a lovely day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.